Hello and welcome to the next 100 Days podcast. My name is Graham Arrowsmith. And my name's Kevin Appleby. So, Graham, we're going into a, a corporate escape story with a difference today. Hmm. Um, y- yeah, we we have invited um, uh, Helen Johns, who's an author, um, and she's a specialist in sort of dementia care. And it's a slight diversion from our normal guests, but, but Helen's got a particular corporate escape story that I'm sure we'll all be interested in. Um, but uh, welcome, Helen, uh, to the next 100 Days podcast. Thank you. Nice to nice to see you this morning. And you know, behind you, you've you've got um, um, a sort of a, ba- a banner or, so, or some sort, and it's called, and it says on there, "A Duck Out of Water." Obviously, it's the name of a book. Tell us more about that. Yeah, I suppose the the um, the title is is yes, the the headline, but the subtitle is probably more important. It's "A Duck Out of Water: Mum, Dementia, and Care Home Life." And where that came from was that when mum went, first went to live in a care home, I went to visit her and she was in the lounge and she sidled up to me and said in her typical Geordie voice, I'm a right duck out of water in here. And as the story goes, she continued to feel that way for the next coming years. And so the story that I tell is about mum's life living with dementia in a care home and the two aspects are the important part of the story a duck out a duck out of water kevin that that'll be a that'll be you if you ever went to sunderland wouldn't it well it would i've been to sunderland twice it was in the away end though graham it was great fun <laughs> i'm still traumatized by the time i went to sunderland at the, in the away end and it must have been oh Years and years ago, I'm traumatized by it. <laughs> I think I actually, um, I mean, it's a little known story, but I actually, um, I started my sales career um, in Sunderland, not so far away from Roker Park. Um, and um, the guy that bought the service, that I, the product I was selling, uh, was in a, a string um, vest, which was, you know, the height of sophistication in Sunderland, of course, because uh, they wouldn't normally have anything at all, uh, anything on, you know, I mean, it'd be, you know, bare chested. So a string vest, I felt really welcome. Um, but um, no, no, uh, it was a, a really, um, a re- one of those memorable uh, moments in life. But, um, but true, truthfully, Sunderland, uh, they are a, an amazing, it's an amazing place. Lovely, lovely venue as well. They've got the sea there. Um, unlike a lot, a lot of us, we don't have the sea on our, on, on our doorstep. But um, apart from the fact that we're taking the mickey, um, Helen, you you're from Newcastle, um, aren't you? So you you're clearly black and white rather than red and white. Oh yes, yes, absolutely. Um, Newcastle. My husband's a season ticket holder, and he'll you know he'll often say that, especially yeah. now. He'll yeah. say, Look, Helen, I have spent years watching that team through my fingers. <laughs> so let me just enjoy this. <laughs> No, I well, I've got to say, as we're recording this, you've just done um, my team a big favour by beating one of our relegation rivals. But anyway, that's another story. So um, going back to a duck out of water, yeah. mum dementia and care home life. Um, where did all this start? I mean, going back before the book, you I mean, you got trained at some at some point in your life and then you then you moved into this sort of field uh, where you're now a sort of a consultancy and you're offering people help in this field. So tell us a bit more about your story. Yeah, well, um, my first well, my first career was in retail. I seem to do my careers in 10 year chunks. The first <laughs> 10 year were in retail and uh, fashion retail. Yeah. And then the second 10 um, was in uh, special education. So um, I was uh, working with young people and adults with learning difficulties and um, it was uh, employment training. So I did all of that work. Loved that, thoroughly enjoyed that. And then the next 10 years, I set up my consultancy and worked um, with, I don't know if you remember, the standards unit where we there was a big national teaching and learning change pro- program. And I'd set up my consultancy at that point. So I was working as an education consultant with schools and colleges and training providers across the North East. Right. And I was literally minding my own business. I say this all of the time. I was literally minding my own business when in 2012, mum was diagnosed with dementia. Right. And there and then my world and that of my two sisters completely changed. 
Mm. And um, it was quite dramatic, the, the change, and we were in crisis very quickly. Mm. Although now when I reflect, there were things, there were signs of what was to come much earlier on, but it was disguised by other health issues and, and what have you. But Did, Can you just... Uh, I mean, sorry to, to interrupt you, though. Yeah. Are we talking about your mum? Tell us a little bit about your mum. What did she do in her life? Yeah. Mom apart from having was, you. Apart from having me, which I'm sure she would have said would have been her greatest achievement. Um, but um, mum was a typical housewife. She um, spent most of her time looking after her three girls. Um, Dad was a shipyard worker, so, you know, tr- traditional Geordie bloke. Oh, mm. when he went to the shipyards. Mum was a part-time worker. She um she worked in the schools. She you know um a dinner lady. She washed the children's hands. Everybody loved Rita or Mrs. Yeah. Johns at the time. Um yeah. uh, and you know I, I can remember being in the the next level of school and watching through the gates at all these kids sidling up to my mum and think I want to be in there. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, and then she had a, um, a job as a cleaner later on. So she only worked part time. And yeah. although I didn't realise it at the time, mum was really creative. She used to love to paint. She loved poetry. She loved art. She loved um, she loved nature, birds. She could name all the flowers. She was she was just stunning. I didn't know it then. But I later learned that she was she was a wonderful woman, creative. So, so uh, come twenty twelve, yes, um, that's when the diagnosis kicked in. But you said earlier that that you kind of noticed a few things happening beforehand. Yes. It would be helpful, I think, for many others, um, uh, perhaps listening to this, um, to find out the kind of uh, early signs that 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 might have. It might not in, immediately give you a, um, a reason to believe that something's going to happen, but it's a bit of an indication. What are those signs? Yeah. Well, the things that um, I should have picked up on and didn't because I saw them all very separately. Um, if I should just put this in context, mum lived alone because dad died in 2001. Right. Um, and for the first, I think, four or five years, she lived independently in our family home. But then after a series of falls, another, you know, minor health issues, um, her daughters kind of bullied her really into moving into a smaller flat. And she saw this lovely little flat and she loved it. And she lived very happily there for many years. Um, But there were a few signs, as I say, that we should have picked up. Mum was always very forgetful. And I just thought it was a sign of getting old. So she'd mislay keys in her purse and, you know, we'd find things in the wrong place. And she'd always be, if we went out, we'd, there'd always be an extra 20 minutes while we found something. She couldn't find a handbag. And that was just the way things were. So she was always very forgetful. But then she started having difficulties with word finding. And she'd say, oh, I know what I'm trying to say, but I just can't get the word out. And later on, she would say, I can see the word, but I can't get it into my head. So there was that. And then um, there was more of the losing thing. There would be forgetting that we'd said something or that we'd done something. And again, we, you know, these were all signs that were I saw very separately, so didn't join the dots at all. You may think this is a little odd, but she was also under the, um, the care of the memory clinic. But that was, you know, it's, it, again, this sounds odd now, but it seems something separate. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I met with the um, uh, the psychiatrist there, a lot of the discussions we had seemed to be around, you know, general memory decline, commensurate with mum's age. And so I, I, I sort of and, took and just back. just so people have some perspective of this around that time, how old would um, uh, Rita have been? been about um somewhere between around 75 to 80 though okay. you know, those, those, yeah so okay. around then and then the biggest um kind of red herring that um made us sort of waste a lot of time was that mom always suffered with urine infections and that caused delirium so mm. she would have episodes of very very um uh, acute either forgetfulness or anxiety or worry and when I used to speak to the psychiatrist about this at the six monthly visits, she quite rightly explained that 
any infection in the body is likely to cause delirium and certainly urine infection was likely to cause delirium. And what we found was that when mum had antibiotics, that delirium would very quickly abate and she would be back to her normal self. So me and my sister, we were kind of chasing the um, UTIs when they arrived or try to prevent her having these urine infections. So we were kind of thinking it was all about the urine infections and trying to prevent all of those, doing everything that we could around mum's diet, etc. But eventually when we got sick of doing that cycle for a good, I'd say, couple of years, I took mum to her GP and that was the first time that anybody mentioned, well, it could be something else. And that GP didn't say the word dementia, but I knew what he meant. And it hit me like a, a truck. When I reflect back, I don't think I knew anything about dementia. It certainly wasn't in my head and all that of my sister. Um, what well, My sister who lives here, I've got another sister who lives over in Australia. So when I, when I went to see the, the GP, that's when I started to join the doc. That's when I started to join the forgetfulness with the word finding and the, um, you know, dates and calendars and all the rest of it, putting things in the wrong place. And then one of the things that um, was the kind of the stark uh, reality was that one day I was in the kitchen, kitchen making tea and mum said, oh, Helen, where's, where's Leo? And I thought, well, he's been dead for a good, you know, at that point, it was um, maybe, or oh, it would have been 15 years at that point. Um, and um, so I popped my head back in and I said, do you mean my dad? And she said, yes, where is he? And so foolishly, I did what I learned not to do much later, was I sat beside her and gently as I could explained that dad was dead. And um, she very quickly sort of remembered, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was almost as if I just reminded her of the day of the week. And she said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And she moved on. And that was it. And I thought that was the end of it. But then, you know, the um, eventually the symptoms escalated. Mm -hmm. The periods between her being um, uh, kind of lucid got shorter and shorter. And her anxiety increased. It's funny because um, as part of the research that I, I did for, for this, um, I, I asked um, um, Bard, the uh, Google's AI thing, I said, well, what are the uh, early signs of dementia? And they said memory loss, just as you were saying, uh, that affects day-to-day -day activities, difficulty concentrating uh, or following instructions, problems with language, such as finding the right words and using them incorrectly, um, disorientation as to time and place, changes in mood or behaviour, becoming more withdrawn or agitated, changes in judgment or decision making, and then problems with visual perception or spatial abilities. So okay. thinking about those um, early signs, presumably most of those you'd recognise in uh, with your mum. Well, you would think, but I was clueless. Now, in, in hindsight, yes, I would have added those things together. But dementia wasn't on my radar in 2012. Um, yes, I knew mum was having more difficulties, but she was having physical difficulties. Yeah. And I just didn't put them together. And anything that I did recognise, I thought was just a sign of ageing, a natural sign of ageing. Yeah. And there's lots that I've learned afterwards, you know, now, you know, having... Uh, engross myself in the world of dementia care I understand that you know dementia is not a natural uh, an inevitable part of aging it's caused by a disease of the brain and you know we can share other things but right. at the time I thought this is just mum getting old and this is just mum more forgetfulness and um, so and yeah. it's more about the UTI you know of course she'll be forgetful if she's feeling this way because of the infection in her body. So we were off on another track and certainly didn't join the dot. And I often say I was worse than clueless at that stage. But I, I don't know. I, I don't think you should particularly be, you know, uh, well, I can understand the situation. However, um, 
the, you know, there are certain things in terms of th that list. I can see myself, you know, <laughs> and, I'm, and I don't know if it's an entirely um, common human thing where it's, it's, you know, where where are my keys? It's, well, they're in the last place that you left them sort of thing. But the point, the thing is, um, you know, I, personally, I'll have word blindness every now and again. So I don't know whether this is an early sign at, at all, but it might be just, you know, just the stress of a situation or whatever it is. But I am cognizant personally of some of these things happening every now and again. So, you know, but, you know, rather than worry about it, um, I just crack on, et cetera. So I can understand, you know, you looking in, particularly when your mum's on her own, et cetera, and you're maybe not seeing all the evidence, just the time that you're together, um, then, you know, it's it might have been easy for you to miss. But come 2012, something then happened. You got in front of a doctor and that doctor said, it might be something else. So take us from there. Yeah. So we started thinking, oh, this could be something else. And so we were in conversations with the psychiatrist. And we, you know, and we still had lots of UTI to deal with. So we were on that road. And then there was an incident. Um, I am um, after 15 years of being with my uh, my partner, Ian, we decided to get married. And so we were getting married in September. And just before the wedding, mum fell and she broke her knee. And she was admitted into hospital. And all the time she was in hospital, she was packing a bag, packing a bag, wanting to come home. And at the time, I thought, well, you know, all of us would want to come home. And then uh, she was allowed out for day release for the um, for the wedding. And then after the wedding, we brought her home because her knee was, her knee was better. And, you know, we sort of breathed a sigh of relief and thought, right, everything will be fine. Mum's where she needs to be. Everything will be OK. No sign of any urine infections, everything's okay. And then very, very quickly, we had more symptoms, more anxiety, and more distress, phone calls in the middle of the night, all of those sort of things. And there was no urine infection. And we knew this was it. And we eventually got a diagnosis. And there was one day when um, uh, mum was so very distressed. Um, we couldn't leave her for a moment. I describe mm. it in the book and I call it the saddest day. And it has to be absolutely the saddest day I've ever had, um, where mum just couldn't be soothed at all for a moment. She was terrified. She wanted to go home, even though she was in her flat. Um, she, was, um, she was unable to even eat. Uh, she couldn't drink. She couldn't do anything. And eventually she was admitted um, as an emergency case uh, into hospital. Mm. And very quickly, we were told by the professionals, quite rightly, that mum needed 24 hour care. That she wouldn't be able to go back home, so we needed to look for a care home. Right. And if I'm honest, I wish we'd known about that earlier. Um, I wish we'd recognised dementia earlier. I wish we'd started care home shopping earlier because we had to do everything at a crisis. Um, and so we found a care home. We, we, we went to look for care homes and um, we found a care home. And we found a lovely care home, not far from where um, myself and my sister Aileen live. Um, it looked right. Um, it was, um, you know, it wasn't posh, but it was lovely and homely. I knew mum would feel um, uh, comfortable there. And the thing that sealed the deal for me was that the deputy manager, well, there's two things that sealed the deal. The room that they showed us was quite large and airy and looked out onto the garden well I thought we'd sort of won the care home lottery at that point but we would love it she loves garden she loves nature she loved this and then the second thing which really sealed the deal was we were talking about you know visits and you know um coming to see mum and the deputy manager said to me we never want you to leave here with a heavy heart and it was, I was so touched. I thought, this care home gets it. They understand that families will be worried and they're interested in making sure that the person who lives here and the relatives are um, supported to continue with a, a good life. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if it was quite as um, well constructed in my head, but it, it touched me. I thought, this is the one. And it would do, because I mean, really what you're saying um, are the are the deputy manager there would have been saying is that it's a it's a place where you can feel comfortable 
that your mum is going to be looked after and that she's going to enjoy her life and and hopefully you can leave in, after your time with your mum and enjoy your life as well so at the end of the day i think it was a wonderful statement and it's probably a as a marketer i'd be thinking of that as a headline and and um you know because it would be something that would dra drag you into that um, um care home kevin do you have any experience of care homes um i've been lucky enough not to have had much experience of care homes and mum's got over 90 and she's still in her own flat which is fantastic but yeah. you know i can see all of the issues coming up here you've got to do something very quickly you've got to find the one that's right and I know that we've had friends that have gone through similar things to Helen. Um, but Helen, this is only part way through the story. Well, yes, your life's been turned upside down by this, but there's a there's something else coming up, and there's a career change coming up. So tell us some more about that. Yeah. Well, the career change only came about. Um, it came about very organically, and I had no intention to steep myself in this world. But what happened is mum moved in and, you know, as the dutiful daughter, I gave them all the information about mum and hoped that, you know, things would settle down very quickly. Mum was still very anxious. Um, and as I kind of observed what care home life was like for mum, I became more and more concerned that it wasn't really what we'd expected. We'd supported mum to go into a care home, thinking that this was going to be somewhere where she would first be safe and well cared for. Um, you know, she would have her medication on time, she'd have food. But more importantly, um, I think we assumed that she would spend her day with people of similar age, there was a communal lounge, there would be somebody around her all day long, so that, you know, if she was frightened at three o'clock in the afternoon or three o'clock in the morning, somebody would be there to reassure her. But the reality of care home life for her was not quite the same as we'd imagined. In many cases, care home life exacerbated her distress. The way the care home was run was very traditional. Um, I have to say, that there were, the carers were kind and polite and efficient and worked hard, but it was very much run in a traditional old style care home. And it was, it felt, although it was, you know, it, it was a lovely care home, it felt like I was coming in to be a hospital visitor really. And, you know, um, that what was expected of, of me was to come in with my bag of grapes, say, how is mum? She's fine. Oh, she's clean. Whatever. She's, uh, she's fed. She's watered. See you next time. But I didn't want that for mum and I didn't want that for me. And the more I saw that mum was distressed, increasingly distressed, and she was bored, she was lonely, she was more confused. She didn't know why she was in this place. Yes, she was confused when she lived in her flat and often asked to go home, even though she was in, the, in her home. When she was in the care home, she felt like she was in prison. Mm. So the locked doors, the key pads, the strange noises, the lonely no lounge where she sat and felt like a duck out of water, all of those exacerbated her symptoms of dementia and made her much more scared and if the lonely lounge was a problem what came next was worse which was a frightening lounge unfortunately there was one lady and you know this is nothing against this lady she was living with dementia and as I now know it she had an unmet need but this lady would sit in the lounge and she would dominate the whole lounge with her show she would berate different um, residents. Um, she would shout at the TV, she would shout at people, and she would, it was, it was very frightening. And again, mum would whisper to me at one point, she said, don't say anything, then there's nothing to pick on. And so I realised that my poor mum was terrified in this lounge. 
And so mum, what she would do was when she was brought into the lounge to socialise and have some company, what she would do was she would get up and go to her room. And so the staff would take her to her room. So she would sit in her room and initially that would be okay. But within a very short period of time, she'd suddenly think, oh, where the hell am I? I need to go home. I need to go and get the girls. You know, thinking she needed to pick up her children. I need to go and get the kids. Because she'd get up, ask to go home. People would say, no, Rita, you need to stay here. No, I need to go home. And then this exchange would start and it would ramp up her anxiety. Mm. So how did that change your career then? So the way that changed, when this went on for a good two years, I would say, and um, I, when I saw this, I thought, I can't, mum can't live like this, I, I can't live like this, mum can't live like this. So I started to find out more about dementia, found out much more. I started as a dementia friend and learned about the main facts about dementia. You know, it's not an inevitable part of aging. Not all of the symptoms are around dementia. They can be around the, the, the environment. It is about a disease of the brain. There is a way to live well with dementia. It's more than, you know, it, there's more to a person than the dementia. Yeah. I started to look at different ways. So I started looking at um, what um, uh, meaningful activity could do. And I found this brilliant organisation called NAPA. Please do look them up if, you, if you're supporting somebody who's living with dementia. NAPA, brilliant organisation. And that stands for National Association of Providers of Activity. And at the time, I didn't even have this language, but I realised through my involvement with NAPA and doing more and more research that actually meaningful activity could be a way to support my mom and to remove some of this anxiety. Meanwhile, as mum was getting more and more distressed, she was referred to a um, challenging behaviour team. I don't use that word now in my professional life. I use distress behaviour because that's a more accurate description of the pr uh, presentation that my mum and other people have. And the occupational therapist recommended meaningful activity as a way to prevent mum's distress rather than to react to. And, you know, the example I gave is if at this moment in time, I don't know how old your children are, but imagine if your children were um, five and six and you got a phone call and said, uh, and this phone call said, you need to come and get your kids, they're poorly. And you said to me, Helen, I need to go and get my kids. They're poorly and they need me now. And I said, tell you what, why don't we have a cup of tea first? No, I need to get my kids and I need to get them now. You need to let me out this door. Well, why don't you stay here for lunch? Or why don't I have a game of dominoes? And clearly that was ramping up the, um, the, the, the distress. So what was recommended was that meaningful activity could help soothe mum so that she didn't get those bored, lonely, frightened, terrified feelings and then asked to come home. Hmm. And so um, there I started, a, um, uh, um, from my mum's home, started doing meaningful activity with the activity coordinators, provided some individual activity for my mum, Ian, my husband, joked that I'd become her own personal activity coordinator. But I wanted to do that for many more, so I wanted to do that throughout the home with the, um, with the other residents. So what are the things then that a personal coordinator, so you were, what were you doing before? And then how did uh, you become this personal coordinator? It's a bit like well, a personal shopper. Well, I wasn't a really, I was an unofficial uh, activity coordinator. In care homes, they have care uh, activity coordinators. Right. But what I ended up doing for my mum was being her personal activity coordinator. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. So my husband. You said then that you wanted to do other work that for other people. So before you became that, is this the ex escape story? So you basically yeah, were doing the, something, then you became yeah. this. Yeah, because I was much more interested now, rather than my education stuff. And I have to say that you know I had to have a hiatus in my work when I was caring for mum yeah. in my education consultancy because right. I was caring for mum, and I was dashing up to the care home every five minutes whenever yeah. she needed me. Yeah, and so. I, I was much more interested in this new life, supporting people who are living with dementia. Yes, yeah. I wanted to support my mum, but I saw this um, care home population who were bored, lonely, frightened, etc. 
Mm. So I wanted to get into this world, so started learning about that, started training. And, and the, sorry, let me just be clear because I'm I'm not I'm not really sure. When you were in education, what did that mean? What were you doing? I was an education consultant. What I did is I worked with um, post sixteen providers. So I worked with um, entry to employment providers, and we worked on teaching and learning resources to um, improve teaching to young people and adults with learning difficulties. Right. So it's helping people with learning difficulties get jobs. I was I was teaching the teachers. As my nephew oh, said to right. me once, okay. Um, okay. my six-year-old said, oh, so you teach the teachers to teach. Yes. Right. <laughs> that was what I was doing. Right. So you, this, it, you had a transferable skill then in the sense that you were helping uh, teachers um, to teach, so train yes. the trainer. So effectively yep. you could just you just change the environment. So yes. your escape, shall we say, from that environment was the fact that you've got a transferable skill that you could move into something that you had real passion for. Absolutely. It was a passion project. And there were so similar, so many similarities. Hmm. Although when I was talking to an, um, an activity coordinator, she says, well, your world's different, Helen. I said, it's not so different. Hmm. In a education setting, in the education setting I came from, the learners had individual learning plans. In your setting, they have individual care plans. And our job, mine as a daughter, he was a professional. I can't tell you that this was welcome uh, realisation. Uh, you know, my my, um, my suggestions weren't always um, welcome or solicited. Um, um, that what it was important for me to do is to make sure that the things that were on mum's care plan were fully implemented so that she had meaningful activity, that she was prevented from feeling anxious by a walk in the garden or sitting, you know, um, uh, uh, doing a flowery. One of the problems surely you faced, though, Helen, was the fact that care homes are you know, notoriously under, under, under staff. They find it really difficult to recruit good staff and keep them. And here you come along and say, oh, I've got this fantastic idea of, uh, of keeping them active. And, you know, for all the best reasons in the world, because to be honest with you, otherwise they get worse whilst they're there. How did you overcome that? Well, it was very, it was really, really difficult because, of course, they saw me as a daughter, first and foremost. Oh, right. Okay. And my, remember, my sort of metamor metamorphosis was organic you know it, it was happening yeah. I was learning as I was going but yeah the more I saw things working not in theory but in practice with mum and in practice with the other residents the more I wanted to share right. the more I didn't see it happening the more I kept putting myself forward or putting the ideas forward now there were a couple of um lucky breaks for me um and one was that one of the managers was very um supportive um, of the changes that um, we talked about, you know, having yeah. more meaningful activity. Uh, because at the beginning, there was very little going on. And so I worked with the activity coordinators and she allowed me to work with those activity coordinators to suggest a more um, a lively programme of activity. Right. Right. But as my learning developed more, I understood more that it's not just about the entertainment so it's not just about having a game of bing or a game of darts or a game of cards or an arts and crafts session. It's about being with the person in those what I call low level activities. So sitting with somebody and reading a magazine together, you know, looking at a jewellery box together, going for a walk around the garden. Things that aren't events as such, but are meaningful activities. And now, in my work, what I do, I always use this, and I always come back to the Newcastle United analogy, so you might like this one, Kevin. When I'm talking about um, being in a care home, I say, you know, if I'm in a care home, you have to start with um, what is important to me, what has been important in my history and what's important now. So if I'm in a care home, yes, get me out there dancing. You know, set of music away, I'll enjoy dancing. But if my husband's in a care home, do not even expect him to dance, you know, don't even put the music on because he's not that bothered. But if you want my husband to be engaged and stimulated, how about something around football? Not mm. just any football, Newcastle United. Mm. Not just any, any Newcastle United going to the match or listening to the match. That is what stimulates him. And that's what is a meaningful activity for him. 
Sorry, I'm going very far down that meaningful activity road. No, I get you now. So basically, you've you you then so you know to cut uh, the story into sort of manageable lumps, you've moved out of the educational field and into this field. Yes. So you then obviously had the um, responsibility to get clients coming to you. So how did how did that? Because you know this presumably in the previous in- incarnation with, with education etc you were well known and all the rest of that and people came came at you fairly readily this was a slightly different field for you yes it was very different field. and so as i say it happened organically what the first step was that i um set up an activity coordinator forum locally because yeah. um my thinking at the time was i need to help mom i need to help mom i need to help mom's care home i need to help all the care homes in the area so I set up the activity coordinator forum in um, in my local area, and I had the pleasure to work with some great activity coordinators, and that started the ball rolling. So they would uh, they would come to the network, they would go back to their care homes, and hopefully affect some change in right. their care homes. Then we moved on a bit more. I started working with my local health watch and got involved in the um, local monitoring um, in um, in care homes. And so that was as a lay person going into care homes and giving feedback on one of the projects was on meaningful activity, whether meaningful activity was taking place and how, you know, how they were doing in that respect. Yeah. I then wanted to go on further. I wanted to go further than just my local area. So then I got involved as an expert by experience with CQC inspections. So started visiting care homes and doing that. And then... Um, few more things happened and then I eventually started working and um, delivering training to activity coordinators on a national basis so I'd be um, working with a team of activity co- uh, trainers and um, we would be working with activity co- coordinators across various care homes across the country. Wow um, so what a, uh, I mean I can understand it's it's almost um, I don't know if we've really had an example of this before Kevin but basically it's an organic um care a uh, uh, corporate escape story so it's almost a corporate transfer st- story in a sense because you've you've you were playing for Sunderland and then you were transferred to Newcastle United so effectively you know I mean and and you know maybe that's maybe the wrong analogy but at the end of the day you were you were doing something something else but you had the skills um to um to move into a different arena yeah I mean that this this is a fantastic story Graham and you know here we've got a book as well supporting a business. It doesn't look like that to start off with. It looks like a book for anybody who's got a problem with a relative who's in care. Mm. But this this is very much in the centre of mm. Helen's business. And we've talked many times to guests about writing that sort of book. Yeah. But now all of this going on, Helen, how on earth did you find time to write a book? <laughs> One word, lockdown. <laughs> um, and uh, what I would like to add as well is that you're absolutely right. It is an escape story and it is organic. And it was painful because um, on the mum's side, that was going on all of the time. Mm-hmm. But getting traction in this new area where in the care home, I was just a daughter, and getting traction in this field, this new field that I knew that, you know, I wasn't the only person that had the answer. There was, um, you know, I was getting my information. And I was learning from the greats in dementia care and of meaningful activity. And I was sharing that. So my skill is to facilitate that and to get the message out. And because I had a passion for it, I could give real live examples with real live residents in a multitude of different environments. Were you, were you selling into a, a vacuum? Though? I mean, there, there would have been some people there that would have been fairly well educated in this area. Then again, you might have found that it had been a fairly low, like the environment that your mum was in, you know, the maybe it was just something that was just never got round to, didn't recognise that it needed to do, or maybe they did, but they just didn't do it. But the point is, uh, you come along as this sort of zealot for a change, and... You know, okay. At some point, there's a pivot between daughter and actually um, uh, a, a practitioner, or, what, or what's the right word, a consultant. So, and then once you're into that consultancy world, then people resonate with your story, and your story supports the actual new um, uh, business that you've got. Yes, 
And the reality is nobody knew about my story. Well, locally they knew about my story and the activity coordinator group. But nationally, when I was working with care homes and activity coordinators nationally, nobody knew my story. Why not? The examples. But why not? Why wouldn't you have talked about yourself? Because wouldn't that uh, have much, much much resonance with them? Oh, do you know, um, I, I've thought about this. I think it was that um, thing about professionalism. Do you know, my, my first 10 years, remember, was in retail and we were drummed in, you know, these, these rules and regulations. And it was a big particular age. And again, in, um, in my first uh, iteration of uh, in education, I was there centre manager, I was the regional manager, you didn't show any vulnerability, you, did, yeah. you know, so I kept all of that to one side, it was my driver, and I might use the examples from either mum or mum's care home, or, or yeah. it would be easy for me to pick an example really quickly, but I might say, oh, I knew a lady, or the person I cared for, I wouldn't say it was my mum. Would you um, still do that though? No, now I've flipped it because of this, because in 2012, I decided, you know, I've kept this quiet for a long time. It wasn't a secret as such. You know, I didn't, I can't say I never spoke about it, but um, I kept it, you know, there's a lady I know or the lady I visit um, uh, or somebody I care for who lives with dementia. But I wasn't as, and I certainly didn't share the whole backstory. I I can understand how that, came about but i but i it would be like it had you had me as a marketing um a consultant working with you i'd have said stop now immediately and start talking about your story because basically that's one thing that would grab at the heartstrings just as it it has the the the, the book itself has had a number of uh, testimonials and people have said that in writing they've said that they you know you've moved them to tears because they rec- recognize that in themselves so by talking about your own personal experience they, they they'll empathize with you but they'll immediately transfer it into their own experience as well and see how that relates to their own uh, mum their own dad or whatever it is so actually you you know my advice would be that you would have been doing a disservice to people by not sharing but now you do and that's the, one of the best things and now you've got a book about the story so you can't you can't hide it anymore <laughs> And the way I structured it in the book, because I wanted to talk about that transformation in me, because um, the way, I, as I say, I structure it is um, the first bit is a duck out of water. Part yeah. one is a duck out of water. Yeah. We get to the point where after two years of my mum being so distressed, and it, it was, an, if you ever get a chance to read the book, it, it, is, it is a difficult read and it was a difficult write. But then I became a daughter on a mission. And that's when I saw all of the learning and getting there. I didn't intend to. It happened organically. So yeah. then the part two is about the career change. Yeah. Part three is about COVID and what happened in COVID. And, we, you know, um, and it's not a spoiler alert, but mum did die in April 2021. Um, but then the fourth bit is, a, um, is um, some tips and hints. If you're in what was my position, uh, over 10 years ago now um so I've done it in that way because I wanted to I wanted to get Rita first I wanted to convey what my mum felt and when you see somebody you love feeling that way then for me I had no option I had to get stuck in as a daughter and then that um created something a fire in my belly about people living with dementia people being um, afforded the opportunity to live well. There's so many misconceptions about living with dementia yeah. and particularly in care homes yeah. um, that I wanted to, to change are, that. Are you, um, I know you can't say this really, but are you angry with care homes? Um, I'm not angry with care homes. I am very concerned that um the focus in care homes is very much on uh, about delivering a service and delivering a service well. And often um, the well-meaning teams, ground level teams, your carers, um, uh, managers mm. are in a constraint that it means they have no alternative but to get, you know, 12 people back to, uh, you know, bathed at some point in the day, 30 people on this floor, um, fed three times a day, medications however many times a day, that becomes the the measure of success. 
Mm -hmm. Whereas what I think is a measure of success is the well-being, emotional and physical well-being of somebody that lives there. We've talked about it before, but basically, I mean, I I was at an event last week and and, um, I was just mentioning the fact that there's a difference between um, Burger King and McDonald's, um, which is the most efficient, which is the most operationally successful to a man and woman in in the training everybody said mcdonald's of course it is burger king they almost conspire to get things wrong i've been to one of their uh, shops recently with the even with the sort of touch screen thing which you'd think would be their opportunity to catch up mm-hmm. it's so confusing so what what i'm the point i'm trying to get to that's one level of of care home management um weights and measured um, operational requirements but you're actually adding another plate. This uh, this idea of the individual. Oh, okay, you, you, she's bathed. She's, mm-hmm. you know, whatever. She's been fed. She's a, 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 she's been cleaned, and all the rest of that. The, her, her room's been cleaned. But there's another level, which is her well being, if you like. Yeah. And it's that level that has to integrate with the lower, the, the the first level. Maybe care homes focus on that first level, but not so much. I don't quite understand how that second level as I would put it, the second plate, if you like, uh, has to integrate. Does it, they might be just thinking, you're getting in the way. Or do they say, actually, we can be really quite clever here about putting these two things together? I don't know. How, how are you finding that? Because that's got to be a challenge for you. Um, in my experience, care homes have got a huge challenge and never more so than now. Yeah. Um, you know, funding, and, and you said earlier, you know, uh, funding, uh, staff aren't well paid, all of those things, you know, exist. So there's a huge conundrum. But some of the things that um, I suggest and that others suggest um, don't include any more costs. They include a shift in thinking. So they do require, at mm. some level, a cultural change um, and a... Um, information sharing whether it be through training or coaching or whatever so that staff understand that actually what they are measured on what they are valued for is how their resident population feel and unfortunately and there will be care home managers screaming here saying unfortunately what we're measured on is yeah the widgets um if you're feeling really well in your mind but your but your bed's dirty Oh, you haven't been bath, bath for three weeks. You see, and it's a real problem, yeah. isn't it? It's, it? it's how do you integrate yeah. the two? But I would say, and I, I say this casually, um, but what I would say is I need both, really. Yeah, you do. But I, do. I used okay. to say about mum, I would rather mum had a dirty bottom and a happy head than yeah. an unhappy head and a dirty... You know, yeah, I, I know. Just, yeah. yeah. And, and can I just say that there were, there were both sides of that in our experience. Um, I, I should also say that after six and a half years, I took the decision um, with my sisters that we needed to move mum to another care home. Um, as And it broke my heart. I cried my eyes out as I was telling the staff that we were moving her because things had progressed so much and um, we just couldn't get it right. So yeah. there, was a, there was a whole host of things. So she yeah. moved to a care home with a completely different philosophy. Yeah. But a butterfly care home. And this is where they managed to do it. Good for they them. managed to integrate the caring for and with, yeah. with all of those jobs. So a, a, a carer would be sat with a, a, a resident for much of the day. All of those jobs still got done. Yes, they did have a higher staff ratio. But the feeling that was engendered by all of those residents was much more of belonging and being at home. Wow, what a story! I, I honestly, um, I, I, you've been a credit to your family and your sisters, and 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 ultimately to your mum and dad, because basically, you know what you've done, you've demonstrated on this podcast is that you've learnt um, from your environment, from the stories, from the pain and 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 the suffering, and and naturally, from like you said right at the beginning, missing various sort of cues that 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 happened, but you couldn't quite put it together until somebody helped you. And I think then you didn't just hang on with that and then say, okay, well, you then took action. Uh, it, it, a massive credit to you. And and we've learned a lot 
um, um, today, Helen, um, here on the next 100 Days podcast. Thank you for being a guest. So, Graham, that was a corporate escape story with a difference and so many lessons in there about challenging the status quo. And one one for me, as, as somebody who loves KPIs, has consulted in KPIs for a career, measure the wrong things and you get the wrong results. <laughs> yeah, I we we, we I, I think that the, I, I was just saying that the, there was um, my heckles sort of went up a little bit when in the, the almost like the frustration that her mindset at the time, Helen's mindset at the time was that you, you have to do certain things in a certain way when it was getting, you know, in, in the case of the, the first uh, care home where her mum resided, um, it, it wasn't, they weren't doing this sort of additional care that, that, that her mum really needed. Um, and, um, and the, there's all, there's all this sort of difference between operational and almost mindset care. Um, and it's very difficult, you know, it's easy to look at it from, from afar and think there's a lot of easy answers. There isn't. So that's why you would need somebody with, with Helen's skill to sort of help, um, care homes negotiate the best route for them. Um, so I, I just, I do think that, um, this uh, escape stories a slight it, it is it's almost like a, an escape transition so basically you you could see that the passion that she had for understanding more about the situation and almost like the little bit of a uh, there's several clues that were coming up but she had really didn't put them together until a moment where the doctor sort of pointed out it could be something else and then basically she then threw herself into learning more and then that became the the transition into a different world. So yeah, I I it in in one way, Kevin, it's very similar to other people, but not the same. Mm. Um and um and I, I really do like I really do like the the fact that um it's about a passion play. It's about something that really uh, uh, meant a lot to her. And then she wrote the book about it, which you mentioned right at the beginning. Oh. No, Graham, that, that word passion, just focus on that for a second. It's something that I'm coming to to understand much more, that if you're really going to achieve something, you have to be passionate about it. Mm -hmm. We've had other podcasts about you know, going to work and being mm -hmm. bored. Yeah, we were yeah. talking to Kevin Hall a few weeks ago about exactly that sort of thing. Yeah. You know, the importance of finding something that you're passionate about and following yeah. it is really important. Mm -hmm. Now, I think one of the reasons, if you look at people writing books, Helen has written a book there because mm -hmm. she is absolutely passionate about it. Yeah. Now, unless you are passionate about what you're sitting down to write, you're never going to finish it. No, uh, no, I think that's true. I, I, I think there's, um, um, th the thing is she can, she can attract people with that book into her consultancy. Um, I, she may never be, you know, um, super wealthy on the back of it, but it'll, it'll create a good living for her in terms of, and more importantly, not only the good living, but really helping those people who need to be helped. And that's maybe the better measure of success. Um, mm -hmm. If you can do something that helps a lot of people, um, particularly vulnerable people who, Otherwise, would be in that um, almost soulless sort of, you know, shared common room where somebody's screaming at the top of their voice and you're feeling intimidated and you don't really don't know what's going on. If you put yourself in the shoes of her mum at that moment, then um, you can understand that by her interventions that she can make now, that would help a lot of people just like her mum was then and potentially other people are now. Absolutely. And I just reflect at the end of this that it's a very deep subject and I'm really grateful that it's a subject that I've never had to go and find more out about. Well, um, it, it has been uh, um, an interest. I didn't quite know where it was going to go, I'll be honest with you, Kevin, um, uh, a subject like this. So we have talked about um, a dementia before with Big Ian, uh, and we'll reference that in the show notes. But um, but I would say to you that it's been quite an, in, an interesting, quite emotional um, uh, conversation uh, because it's about somebody's mum. 
Uh, and I think that really um, it opened up a conversation about the way in which she's developed as, a, as an individual and helping other people. So today, I've been Graham Arrowsmith. I've been Kevin Appleby. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>